Hi everyone, welcome back. So today we are talking about Girl Interrupted, the memoir by Susanna Kaysen. And what we're going to do in this presentation, what I'm going to do is oh, not drop my microphone. And um, we're going to talk about her background and a little bit of context regarding when the book was published and also when it takes place. Um, then we'll get into some of the more literary elements of the book. We'll talk about tone and structure and themes and what some people had to say about it, including the author herself. So let's dig in. Um, Susanna Kaysen was born in 1948 in Cambridge in a Jewish family. She was the daughter of uh, an economist and professor at MIT. So she attend, attended the Cambridge School of Weston. And then at 18 years old, she is sent to the McLean Hospital for psychiatric treatment, which occurs in 1967. That treatment lasted a year and a half, um, 18 months. And that is what the book is based on. It's based on her time in that institution. So um, after that point, she was married, she lived in the Faroe Islands, and she wrote several novels, including Asa As I Knew Him, Far Afield, which is about her time in the Faroe Islands, and Cambridge, which is kind of a lightly fictionalized book. It's kind of a little bit based on her life, um, as well as another memoir, The Camera My Mother Gave Me. So quite a prolific author. Um, this book was published in 1993, and it really saw great acclaim at the time. I think now more people probably are aware of the movie um, starring Winona Ryder and Angelina Jolie. Angelina Jolie won an Oscar for the film, um, but we'll get into that and the author's feelings about the film a little bit later. Um, but I think that in the context of when this book was published, it really came into prominence just at the start of a larger conversation throughout the United States about mental health. And so you have um, a book called Listening to Prozac by Dr. Peter Kramer that also came out the same year. We had um, the Clinton administration, which and enacted some anti-discrimination laws so people could not be discriminated against on the basis of mental illness, or at least legally, people could not. Um, and that was also introduced as part of the health care reform bill in 1993. So there's this whole kind of conversation about mental health and, and really the start of uh, a process of destigmatization that prior to this point, a lot of times mental health was very much stigmatized and people with mental health problems were kind of seen as other or different. This book is um, plays a role in that conversation. So the destigmatization of mental health and the acknowledgement that people very often are reacting to the circumstances in which um, they're they're born or in which they're put, they're reacting to the stressors of life and mental health does not always look like the person in the psychiatric institution. It could be um, having major anxiety and having to do a presentation at work or at school, um, struggling with depression and grief and not knowing really how to get through the day, right? All of those types of things. Now, I will say that personally, I think that the movie kind of goes against that and and kind of re reinforces some of the stereotypes and stigma um, because of some of the fictional elements that they include. But um, it's kind of an important to know that this book is also about the 1960s and the mental health care during that time. So a large contrast by the 90s. But um, in terms of when 
she was in this institution in 1967. That's just a few years after Ken Kesey's book One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest was written. Um, and then that was later turned into a film as well in the 1970s. Now, the thing about One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest is that that is a novel, so it is fiction. However, Ken Kesey worked as a, a night duty janitor in a mental health facility and he kind of realized that there was not as much of a separation between the patients and the doctors and kind of everyone else that he thought there would be initially and tried to kind of show number one the treatment of these patients but number two also the fact that um that they were they were stigmatized and they were thought of as as other when in reality sometimes the doctors treating them may have also had some mental health difficulties right um one of the other things about ken kesey's book is that he tries to show that um the people in this ward it's kind of a metaphor for the united states and i know we're not reading that book but um if you've ever read the book or seen the movie um the people in the ward it's kind of a metaphor for the united states and a lot of the um the the nurses and doctors are kind of like um, politicians or bureaucrats and a lot of the patients are more rebellious um, rather than mentally ill, right? So that is something else that carries over into this memoir. And I think that the author, I'm not sure how deliberate she is about that, but that's something that I'd like for us to discuss in our class. Do you think she's being deliberate or do you think that that's just kind of coming out naturally in her experiences? So the tone of this book is quite interesting to me. And I think it's one of the reasons that it did find such critical acclaim. A lot of books about mental health and people struggling with mental health get into um, a little bit of sentimentality, right? There's sometimes um, a little bit of like, woe is me, or this is what I went through, and I want you to sympathize with me, or I want you to really understand how I was hurting. The author here doesn't really do that, um, which I think is some an, an interesting choice. So instead of having that kind of a tone where she's trying to draw sympathy and empathy from the reader, she does at certain times, but not in a sentimental way. Really, she is angry about the situation. And she has at some points kind of a dark, like cynical um, or darkly humorous, sarcastic kind of tone. The other thing is that she is recapturing the voice of an 18 year old um, and 19 year old that she was. And I think that the tone of being kind of sarcastic and a little bit rebellious is pretty accurate to how a lot of 18 and 19 year olds feel. So um, one of the other things I'd like you to notice and that you'll probably pick on right away is the structure of the book. So this can be really divisive. A lot of people either hate the structure or they really respond to it. The book is kind of broken up into three sections. So there is um, entry into McLean Hospital and then her time there and then her exit and kind of re-entry into, uh, into the world. Um, having said that, within those parts, particularly in the, the middle while she's in the hospital, it really is told in a nonlinear way. So each chapter is uh, focusing on either an event or one of the other women in the institution with her. Um, and because of that, it reads to me, I guess the best way I could put it is that it, it reads almost like a diary would be that she's trying to kind of recreate, but it also reads sort of like that's how memory works. You know, we've talked about memory a lot in this class when people are writing memoirs and they're remembering back on their time. She is writing this book in, I think she started it in 1990. She had to get some of her hospital records, which some do appear in the book. So that's kind of interesting too. Um, to kind of ground her experience and to show you the like the bureaucracy of the situation. But 
Um, when you're remembering back to when you were 18, 19, and, and now at this point she would have been around in her 40s, um, it is fragmentary. And particularly given the fact that she's in this hospital where not too much changes, people come in and out, but day to day there isn't a whole lot um, necessarily to do. And so because of that, um, it would be, I think, even harder to recall, like, what happened uh, in February of the first year you were there as opposed to the second year, right? Because she's there for over a year. Um, and what happened maybe in February as opposed to March, those kind of things. So what you'll see is, for example, a chapter with um, a focus on one of the patients. At the end of the chapter, we find out that the patient dies. Um, and I don't want to say who because I don't want to give too many spoilers. Um, but the the individual that she's been describing dies. The next chapter, she's recalling a specific event of going into town. And the patient from the previous chapter is in this next chapter because it's not told in a directly linear way, meaning we don't go from February to March to April to May, um, et cetera, and so forth. Um, so I would say, though, that two, a couple of people say that this book does not have a plot. So if you look for other, um, look at other resources or other teachers talking about this, they might say that the book doesn't have a plot. The book does have a plot. <laughs> um, well, it doesn't have a plot in the traditional sense that a lot of novels or even some of the memoirs we've read have a plot. What I mean by that is that a lot of books are action driven and this book is character driven. But the plot also has to do with the stakes. Um, what is at stake for the central character? So Susanna is the central character of her own narrative. She's the protagonist, if you will. Um, the stakes for her are that her identity has kind of um, was already in question because she was a young teenage girl in the 1960s. Now she's possibly struggling with mental illness, possibly not. That's never fully made clear. We'll get into that in a minute. But once she comes to this institution, her identity is really completely stripped from her. And so we have this type of fragmentation that comes through in the structure of the book. And it is also one of the themes, this fragmented self and this loss of identity. So the stakes really kind of are her coming out of that situation or even within that situation, trying to hold on to pieces of herself and trying to discover who she is and um, and what kind of person she's going to be or who she's going to become later on in life. And um, and to me that there is a plot there. <laughs> it's just it's just done a little bit differently. Um, but here is a little bit of a a quote from her um, about kind of relating to this theme. She says, in a strange way, we were free. That's her and the other patients or um, as as she calls them here, the inmates, because it did feel like like being in prison. In a strange way, we were free. We'd reached the end of the line. We had nothing more to lose. Our privacy, our liberty, our dignity. All of this was gone and we were stripped down to the bare bones of ourselves. So that um, that theme is really pervasive throughout the book. And I really enjoy the way that she uses this diary like um, fragmented uh, recreation of memory in order to kind of convey that theme. Another theme that you're going to see that I already kind of mentioned is mental health stigma. So the beginning part of the book, um, Susanna is placed into this facility and she makes it very clear that she doesn't feel like she belongs there. She talks about how she talked to the doctor for only a few minutes that he had never seen or treated her before and that she did not feel really like he knew her or knew what was going on with her. Having said that, um, she's diagnosed with 
borderline personality disorder and major depression. And a few of the criteria for that uh, borderline personality disorder, also known as BPD, um, include the following. One, tumultuous, let me try that again. Number one, tumultuous relationships. Um, Very often that is um, a period of of obsession and then a period of devaluation. So the person that um, this individual is with seems perfect and wonderful and they can do no wrong. And then they go into a period where everything that person does is wrong. And so it's this very much like black and white love hate kind of thing. Um, Number two, an ever-changing self-image. Number three, impulsive behavior. Number four, frequent episodes of self-harm. And number five, disassociative episodes spurred on by stress. So some of the things that we see happen in this novel, uh, I'm sorry, in this memoir, are that she does have some disassociative periods. She has periods where she sees, for example, um, a a carpet that has a pattern in it and she starts kind of seeing things in the pattern. At one point, she um, feels like her arms might not actually have bone in them and she starts scratching at herself to try to get to that bone. She talks about um, kind of imagining or thinking that there's a parallel world that she's slipping into and out of and those types of things. At the same point, the author herself is pretty adamant that she did not really have a problem and that a lot of this was kind of down to things that most adolescents go through. Having tumultuous relationships and having a fragmented sense of identity and not having clear goals and all of that kind of thing. Um, So... It's not necessary, I don't think, to kind of try to armchair diagnose her to to ask, does she have a mental illness or does she not? What I think is more important is that we recognize the fact that mental illness is very hard to define and that, um, you know, what she's doing is showing that there is a stigma and that she says at one point other people ask her how did she get into that institution and she's like what they really want to know is would i end up in the same situation and her answer to them is like well it's kind of easy to end up in that situation if the pressures of life get to you and you're struggling to cope with your trauma that's kind of what happens, right? So that's one of the things she's trying to show here, that there is no clear line between the mentally ill or the crazy and the normal. That line does not exist. Everybody's kind of somewhere on the line at any given point in their life, and they can go from one end to the other um, quite quite easily. Um, Another theme that you're going to see here is the idea of the patriarchy so and and also kind of bureaucracy going along with that so for example the doctor asks her if she's uh sexually active this would have been in the late 1960s more people were being sexually active outside of marriage or at least more open about it um but the fact that she has a number of boyfriends, the fact that she is sleeping with her current boyfriend and that he is clearly not the first person that she slept with, um, the way that she dresses, all of these are kind of counted against her and they're signs that she's not stable. Um, we have um, later on, we have um, some of this similar discrimination when she tries to um, exit the facility. So there's some sort of job related gender discrimination going on that she's encouraged even by the nurse she looks up to to go into intellectually not challenging work, um, something that she feels is kind of beneath her skill level and her intellect. Um, And there are not a lot of choices for her. She thinks at one point about possibly becoming like a dental hygienist. um, And then she also has options to marry. So 
that's something that at that at that time really would have been um, quite common for women to not have that many options. If you wanted to be a teacher or if you wanted to be um, a, a service worker in, in different positions, doing things like cooking or laundry or, or, or being a waitress, those kind of things. But some of the other jobs would not really have been fully open to her because we're still kind of at the very nascent, the very beginning stages of the feminist movement. So those are some things I'd like you to look for. In terms of being um, looking at the other characters, I think that there are some who are defined by their mental illness, but mostly um, as she does with her own portrayal, she's trying to show that people are not just defined by this one thing in their life, right? So we have characters, um, Alice, Daisy, and Polly, who very are um, who are very clearly mentally ill and kind of really struggling. You also have um, unnamed characters who are catatonic, but they're also very drugged up. And the, there is a question as to like um, one girl comes in and she she wants this belt that her brother has given her. It's taken away from her for her safety so that she doesn't try to hang herself with it. Um, other pieces of her identity are stripped away and then she kind of sits in front of the TV and, and that's where she stays through the rest of the book. Um, we have... Tori, who's a drug addict, her parents are trying to force her to go back to Mexico with them. And here's what she says. Being in Mexico means being dead and shooting speed to feel like you're not quite dead. Um, you can see there again, this reaction against society and against people forcing you to, to do things you don't want to do and to be somebody that you don't want to be. Um, we have Georgina and her boyfriend, Wade. Um, both of them are patients. Um, Georgina is Susanna's roommate. And at first, it's kind of said that she's the most kind of um, normal one there, or at least the one that Susanna kind of gravitates toward, that they feel, both of them feel like, yeah, we have some problems, but we don't really belong here. Um, but Georgina has um, been diagnosed with schizophrenia, and her boyfriend Wade also seems to have quite strong delusions um, relating to things like conspiracy theories and the government and things like that. Having said that, they are in this um, relationship with each other and they're both friends with Susanna and so we get to see other aspects of their personalities and then we come to Lisa and Lisa so Lisa um, Rowe is the one that was depicted by Angelina Jolie in the movie and the author can't really decide whether she is uh, has a sickness. Um, she's been diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder, um, possibly a sociopath, um, or if she's just rebellious. Because again, it's the late 1960s, and teens rebelling um, was really a, um, a almost a almost, but not quite. Um, a bloodless revolution, meaning that in our country, the culture shifted at this point in time quite drastically. And you have the hippie movement and the civil rights movement and then the women's movement a little bit um, later on and um, the second wave of feminism in the 1970s with the women's movement. And so Lisa is kind of in this place where um, in another time, maybe she would not have been diagnosed with anything. Um, but she does keep trying to run away. And um, she's very charismatic and, um, and kind of enthralls everybody that she meets. So some of the um, criteria for that diagnosis would be Failure to adhere to social norms relating to lawful behaviors, deception in the name of self-interest, aggressiveness and frequent irritability, pervasive disregard for the well-being of others, repeated irresponsibility as evidenced by a failure to fulfill daily obligations, and lack of cruelty, lack of remorse for cruelty toward others. So I'd like you, again, not to kind of 
um, diagnose or re-diagnose these people. But to think about um, whether you think that she um, fits those criteria or does she sound like a rebellious teenage girl who's trying to um, not conform to the bureaucracy that she's in or to the patriarchy that's kind of placed her in this institution. Um, we also have Lisa Cody who tries to rebel and copy everything that Lisa Rowe does. And um, I don't want to spoil too much, but the outcomes of that are quite interesting to watch unfold. Um, we have also here the idea that the cure is worse than the treatment. Um, I think that if you've read the yellow wallpaper, you know, in that story, you have a, whim a woman who is confined to a room by her patriarchal husband and she starts to hallucinate and see things and it seems like possibly this might be what's going on with Susanna that once she's in this institution she goes through this period of depersonalization so seeing things that's not there um, being kind of detached from herself and seeing herself almost like a different person um, and as I mentioned before the slipping in and out of the parallel world, the, the scratching up of her skin, looking for bone, all of that kind of thing. Um, what I want to read to you here is a quote from a critic, Hyun Ju Yu, and she wrote the article, Depathologizing the Traumatized Self in Girl Interrupted. So here's what she says. Significantly, as Kaysen reworks the memories from her traumatic adolescence, she does not depict her younger self as borderline personality disorder or depressed, whose identity is defined, diagnosed, and interpreted as fractured and unstable by medical professionals. The not... <laughs> the novel the memoir provides a way of exercising agency denied her as a young adult and in it she rebuilds an image of her traumatized self as an active agent she endows her persona with rebellious and subversive power to resist patriarchal medical authorities and in a broader sense to disrupt the dominant sexist culture pedagogies imposed on young women in the late 1960s. So let's break that down. What she's basically saying is that in this book, Susanna Kaysen does not depict herself as a victim, that she is processing her trauma through this lens of saying it's the late 1960s and I was a woman and I was rebellious and I have agency now to retell my story and to kind of re- um, capture that identity that I lost when my life was, as the book's name is, interrupted during that time period. Um, her book title is taken from a painting called Girl Interrupted, which she talks about in the book, but she does feel like her growth and her development. And is this a coming of age story? I don't think so. I think unlike some of the other memoirs we've looked at, it's the story of how someone's coming of age was kind of truncated or cut short or stopped in the middle. Um, and then she has to kind of pick that back up and rebuild it. Um, the author herself has kind of disavowed this book. She hasn't said that it's not true, but what she said is that basically it doesn't feel like her anymore. And she kind of feels disconnected from it, which to me makes a lot of sense. Um, I wrote a book that was fictionalized version of some of my experiences as a young adult. And when I look at it, it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't feel like me now at all. Or if you think about like, you know, I said that this is a lot like a diary. Think about if you found a diary from when you were like in middle school. Does that version of you feel like the version of you that you are now? Probably not. And this book was written in 1993. So we're talking about over 20 years ago. And now that she looks back, it kind of it doesn't feel quite like her, even the her at 
1993 um, now that she's in her 70s it doesn't feel like her at all so I think that that's kind of interesting to not say that's not me but that that's not who I am now um, she mentions that a lot of people who come up to her who read this book um, who love it are people who don't really read a whole lot of other books that somehow either they were assigned the book like you are um, or they found it and um, somehow it kind of spoke to them and spoke to their experience experiences, especially younger teenage girls who are struggling with things like anger and depression and anxiety and, and identity and, and all of that kind of thing. Um, so she also said that the movie, um, she doesn't love the movie and she doesn't hate the movie. What she said about the movie was that she's seen it about three or four times, um, probably at premieres when it first came out, and that it feels like being in many different locations all at once because it's a little bit of the book that she wrote, a little bit of her experiences, highly fictionalized, and she said it kind of, again, doesn't feel like her story. So she doesn't really love it or hate it, but she did say that she felt like Angelina Jolie's performance was a little bit over the top and a little bit too much. Um, so not quite like the girl who she remembered. Um, in an interview, she was asked, do you feel like your time at McLean helped you or hindered you? And here's what she said. I think it did both. It was helpful to not have to participate in life. I like it, but it was also bad because I didn't participate in life. It was good and bad. This is a major theme that I'd like you to look at, the idea of freedom versus responsibility. There is some freedom from responsibility in the ward, but at the same time, the ward is limiting freedom and limiting um, growth and development and all of that. And those are some things that sometimes come out of having responsibilities. Um, so it's quite interesting that she acknowledged that. She also said... Um, there was some fiction in the book, but that's for me to know. She said, I made some composite characters to protect identities and combined some histories and characteristics so that people weren't completely recognizable. I did try to stick to the truth of things as well as I could tell them. So an acknowledgement that, um, yeah, I think with this type of a book, it would be really difficult to, if you were completely telling all of the details. She mentions that the first draft of this book was 400 pages. It's quite a bit shorter. Um, um, because there were too many details the first time and it was boring. <laughs> so we're kind of, we should be glad that she kind of shortened it up. Um, this is the other thing she said when people read it and respond to it. She said, that's how I felt when reading books as a child as well and as an adolescent. How many young people thought they were Holden Caulfield? But I didn't go into this thinking, I'm going to make a lot of people feel like I understand them. I feel like I'm lucky in a way. It doesn't happen to too many people that you write something that lots of people find important and meaningful. People were loving the book and maybe that matters because they were able to see it the way they needed to see it and that's a good thing. So with that, that's where we'll leave off. Um, I love the reference to Holden Caulfield, which is from Catcher in the Rye, a book, an, again, about a rebellious teenager. And I'm excited to see your thoughts. Do you think that um, her memories come through clearly? Do you think that she... Um, does a good job in trying to kind of destigmatize some of these mental health things. Do you think that her story shows a reflection of um, the patriarchy and the male driven bureaucracy that she was kind of caught up with in, at the time and that many young women were caught up with um, in that same time period? Um, so that's it. I can't wait to see your thoughts. Thanks, everybody.